ahead and get started. Welcome to the CSFP lecture. So we lost our first spring break. Um, tonight we're obviously hearing about CUDA. So I will let you introduce yourself. Okay. And we can go from there. So my name is James Balsow. I'm a PhD student here at CU in the computer science department. Um, I did my master's degree at DU, and most of my research focused on CUDA and various GP, GPU programming kinds of things. So that's, I also have a research job, and I do GPU programming pretty much all day long. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk specifically about CUDA, and it's kind of a pretty wide range of topics. Um, first, we'll just give like a little bit of an intro on why people use GPUs and for, for general purpose computation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about parallel processing and give some examples of the you know, what sorts of issues you have and what the, the standard types of things that happen are. We'll talk a lot about CUDA um, and give some examples. We're going to spend a lot of that time on um, how memory is organized in the GPU. Um, it, depending on, on how things go, maybe we'll talk about some of the more advanced techniques. Um, there's a lot of issues with this stuff. It's definitely not like, you know, you fire up Eclipse and you write a whole job application in 10 minutes. It's not like that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of that and then we'll, we'll wrap up and have questions and stuff. Um, what I'm not going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk about OpenCL. I could, but that, that's a different talk, so that's different. A lot of what I'm going to say applies to, to the OpenCL stuff, but um, it's a little, not quite as um, formed yet, I think. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm also not going to talk about, um, you know, the, the, I'm going to just make some assumptions on, on what you know and what you don't know. And if that, those things don't, if I start talking about stuff, you're like, whoa, just stop me, ask questions. There's only a few of us here, so we, we can do that. Or the reverse, if this stuff is totally boring, stop me and we'll, we'll move on to something else. All right, so why do we use GPUs? Well, a little, a little background. You probably all know about Moore's Law and how it's kind of failing. Um, we're not getting faster processors, and we haven't for years. Um, you know, I think four gigahertz is about the fast that we can get, and we had four gigahertz a couple years ago. So what's, what's the problem? Well, there's kind of a physical limit in increasing processor speed. We're still jamming the transistors onto the chip, but they're not getting the chip any faster. They're making the chip do more things. So um, that, that's where the Moore's Law is still legal and it's, we still follow it, but we, it no longer really applies to processor speed. For the longest time, we just threw speed, speed, speed. Now we have to throw parallelism to, to utilize all those transistors and all that silicon. Um, so what that gets us is um, <clears throat> we, we can do a lot more things on the chip, and one of those things we can do is we can use hardware to manage our processes. So instead of having an operating system with a context switch, copying all of the registered data out, um, we just have hardware do all that for us, and we have context switches totally for free, instantly, which is kind of nice. GPUs have huge memory bandwidth. Um, I think the GPU I'm going to talk about tonight has like 250 gigabytes a second from main memory, which is really fast, and we can. And in certain types of applications, uh, we can really utilize that. That's one of the reasons these, sometimes you were, this is referred to as streaming processing, stream processors. Um, lastly, when, when GPUs were first started to use, be used for general purpose computation, people really, basically what they did was they loaded up direct uh, they, uh, OpenGL buffers and did matrix, matrix operations on them and then just read the data up. They didn't really display it to the screen. That was kind of definite magic hackery, uh, but now we can program these things and have them do almost anything we want. There are some restrictions, and I'll talk about those, uh, but with all these things, it's definitely a, a, a bonus. Um, and I think the biggest reason here is that on, oh, and I, I'll just say this, this talk is mostly going to focus on NVIDIA products. I don't work for NVIDIA. I, I'm not trying to push NVIDIA, but I do believe they're easy to use. So I, I know most about NVIDIA, and we're, gonna we're just going to use these numbers. The latest general purpose GPUs from NVIDIA have over 2,500 cores on it. 2,500 cores is a lot. The, the Janus supercomputer at CU has 16,000 cores. So one GPU card has an eighth of, of the core uh, number that Janus has. Now that's 
comparing apples to oranges, definitely, but it's still kind of a fun number. I mean, you could throw eight GPUs into a server rack and you, then you'd have eight Janus. I mean, that's not, like I said, it's not quite true, but there's a lot of silicon and a lot of transistors and a lot of pops that these things can crack out, and that's one of the reasons that they're, they're, um, we're, we're looking at them. Though it is difficult, and there's, there's definitely more work and research that needs to, be go, to go into this stuff to make it easy to use. Um, so the, the raw computing power, like I mentioned, <clears throat> they're cheap. So a large cluster, Janus-sized cluster, is over a million dollars. It's just, it's expensive. Um, but, you know, like I said, you buy eight of these GPUs for maybe 20,000 bucks and you get a similar, similar performance point. Um, again, there's, it's, it's not the same comparison, but for a, a dollar per flop, it's definitely a worthwhile investment or, or investigation anyway. That's why I think we're still looking into this to make sure it's okay, but I think it will be in, in the long term. Um, GPUs are everywhere. Every computer that has a display has a GPU on it. So, um, yeah, some of them are older, some of them are not. Most GPUs are going to have 40, 50, 100 cores now, especially in you know, your laptop. I don't, I don't know how many cores in, in this one. I think it's 256 or 128. So it's a decent amount of parallelism in, in just these everyday machines. Um, they're also pretty stable. So they've been around for a long time. It's not like a new type of technology. It's not some new crazy way to you know, quantum computing that may or may not work. It's something we know and we've used before. So that's why people, uh, managers and business people tend to, to like that sort of thing. Um, they're pretty practical, like I said. They're, if, if you want just raw power, you can stick them all in a rack. <clears throat> you don't need a huge cluster. Uh, you can put one on your desk if you're doing science research and not have it make everyone go deaf. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of bonuses, uh, power, a lot of cool stuff about them. Um, and, and before I go there, I think the whole concept of a GPU, we can, we can extend that into accelerators in general. AMD has a fusion chip, which has uh, a GPU and a CPU on the same die. Um, the GPU doesn't really get used for GPU stuff, it's just used to accelerate things. So I think as time goes on uh, in the industry, we'll see more of the term accelerator. Maybe not, but um, that's they're proving their worth because of the, the reasons I mentioned, and, and uh, I think we'll continue to see that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give a little bit of background on parallel processing and just what, what some of the issues are. Um, if this is, you know, all this, just feel free to stop. <clears throat> so, like I said, most of our our transistor increments are going into things like parallel processing. So a little bit of background on this. There's a few types of parallel processing from a really high level. Um, first is the one we're probably most familiar with, and that uh, that's shared memory parallel processing system. So you have more than one core, more than one processing unit, all connected to the same memory bus. So they can share information via the memory. Um, that's like my laptop and your laptop multi-core machines. Um, also, multi-socket machines where you have a, a server with maybe a, hard, a motherboard that has four or five, six chips in it. Um, those are all shared memory computers. There's distributed memory. Basically, a distributed memory machine is a cluster. It's a bunch of computers networked together. Um, typically, they're networked via really high speed bus so they, they don't incur the same latency as Ethernet or something like that. Um, but there is a communication cost and <clears throat> the, the, the bonus over of a distributed memory machine is typically each, each node in the cluster has the same amount of memory and it's usually a lot. So for a whole huge cluster you typically get more total memory than you do on a single shared memory parallelism machine. Um, so when you hear the word supercomputer those big machines like Jaguar and Titan and K and those things, those are all clusters and they, they call those LCFs, leadership class facilities. Um, let's see what else. So now we have this term accelerators, um, like our GPUs. There's also, uh, which we'll talk about today, there's also FPGAs. People use FPGAs for parallel processing. Um, I've never used an FPGA. I, I, I get, you know, kind of how it works, but there's some issues there. Sometimes they're really good and they, they, they actually work out better um, than most 
most of the other things listed here, but there, you know, that's just another way to get to get processing. I'm not going to talk much about that because I'm not an expert. Another way that people people get parallel um, computation going are there, there, via certain asynchronous kinds of operations. And a typical computer, a typical computer, you have a CPU that's doing some things, and you have some peripherals like the memory, like the network, and um, there are certain things in the computer that allow say the network to talk to the GPU or some other device without having to get the CPU involved, things like DMA and, and other types of um, transfers. So instead of the CPU having to manage that sort of thing, you can maybe kick off a transfer between two devices or two areas or whatever you want and go do some other work and then come back when that transfer or that interaction is finished. So that's, that's another way to get parallel processing, you can get that on shared memory machines, on GPUs, that's just kind of a generic way, another way to look at things. So, I'm going to give a specific example there, and this is kind of the, the canonical um, parallel processing introductory example, it's called a reduction. Do we know what a reduction is? So, say you have an array of numbers, say it's a million numbers long, or, or a billion numbers long, and you want to find the maximum. Typically, you would write code that says for i equals zero to length, check each one of those, and, and is it greater than the one the max I had before? If it is, let's reset and keep going. So that's a, a serial operation. We go through the whole array in order, and then at the end, we find what the maximum is. So in a reduction, a reduction is basically, it's called a reduction because it's a big length, big list of numbers, and you're, you're getting one or two or three things out of it. You're getting the max, you're getting the min, maybe you get the sum, the average, all these things are, are called reductions because you have a long input and you reduce it to one or two numbers. So how do you do this in parallel? If you have four cores on your machine or two cores and you have a million numbers and you want to find the sum or you want to find the max, what do you do? Well, you can, you can do this a couple of ways. You can chunk up your data into four pieces and then have each processor work on a chunk of that data. And at the end, one processor will have its max, the other processor will have another max, and, the, and so on and so forth. And then from there, you can find the max of those four numbers, and there's your max. And you've done that now in approximately one-fourth the time, maybe. So um, <clears throat> that's a pretty optimistic uh, estimate, but, but that's, that's in essentially what a reduction is. So you're having, the, the, and the, the important thing to note about the reduction is that what one processor doing has no effect on the other processor. You typically you think of it as serial, but in this case it isn't. So two processors, one processor checks two random items and they, they either sum or they do the max, and other processors do that as well, but this one processor doesn't care. So at the end, each processor has a max. And once that's done, you have to do this process again and find the max of all the processors. So you can kind of see this tree structure growing, um, and, and eventually if you have lots and lots of processors and lots and lots of data, um, you, you know, you look at just regular binary tree and log n kind of operation. But you do get the parallelization improvement. So like I said, with the four processors, you split it up into fourths. It's going to take approximately one-fourth of the time that it would to go serial. So that's just kind of a... Um, an example of parallel computing and what types of things happen. Um, it gets a lot more complicated, but that's kind of the, the intro example. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about how to do that on a multi-core. You have, you know, your one processor just, you know, goes from I to length over four. The next one goes from length over four times one to length over four times two, and so on and so forth. Um, but what about in a, in a cluster? How do, how do we do this in a cluster? Well, we have to somehow disseminate all the data to all the machines in the cluster. So, yeah, we're getting this, this speed up from having the, the, the stuff go, the operations go in parallel, but we have to broadcast all the data. Everyone needs to get some of that data. So we have to communicate, and depending on the operation you're doing, you may need to communicate a lot of data to all the clusters. I mean, all the things in the cluster. So that's, that's kind of the counterbalance of this. And in the, in the shared memory example with the multi-core machine, 
if you have a ton of data, a whole ton of data, you might not be able to fit it all in memory. So even if you have one processor working on a million things, if those million things are, I don't know, a meg each, it's probably not going to fit. So then you need more memory. So you have this either pros and cons for each thing. Um, how do we do this in a GPU? It's very similar to what happens on a shared memory machine, and we'll talk about that. And I have no clue how this would happen on an FPGA. <laughs> All right, so, you know, I mentioned at the beginning we get this instant 4x speed up, but what do we have to pay for that? We have to pay either a communication cost or possibly a large memory cost. And one, depending on the problem, one or both of those things may not be feasible. So there's, there's issues here. It's not, it's not like a turn the switch kind of thing and you automatically get a 4x speed up. So, that's just kind of my introduction to parallel processes. Do we have any questions on that, or do we, does that make all make sense? Yeah. 